everybody. Welcome back to the Your Story, Our Fight podcast brought to you by Lupus LA and sponsored in part by GSK, uh, really great partners in our Your Story, Our Fight campaign. Um, we have a super impressive guest today, and I am so excited to have this conversation because her lupus story is um, so powerful and has so many twists and turns, uh, much like some of the programs that uh, she's known for. She's best known uh, as the showrunner, executive producer, and co-creator of Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, just finished its seventh and final season on ABC. And we are so excited to be joined by Marissa Tanchera on today. How Hello. are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> so pretty I, well you, with my last name, too. All right, but. good. That's, I'm not going to try it again because, you know, then I'll, if I say it differently <laughs> twice, I'm going to be in trouble. But uh, <laughs> no, so I, you know, I was just in reading about your story and talking to you, I, um, I'm so impressed with all the things you accomplished because you were diagnosed at 15 with lupus. And, you know, I know I was diagnosed at 16, as we talked about, and I found it to be life changing in terms of what I mentally thought about doing with my life and the the activities and things I I did. So what I'm amazed about is that you, knowing you had lupus, set out on this career as a dancer, a singer, uh, performed with Michael Jackson and Shaka Khan. And you did all these things sort of under the auspices of lupus. Um, and, right. and I think a lot of times we hear stories where people are already in those careers and then develop lupus. And, and so I just, I'm curious about how you motivated yourself to, to take on that path. Right. Um, well, that age, 15 is a very tough age already. Adolescence forming your identity, all those things. Um, And then to add the diagnosis of a chronic autoimmune disease at that age was a lot to process. Um, Much of my work as a child, I mean, I started very early. um, I was a performer kid and doing the whole showbiz kid path from the age of, God, I don't know, six up until, booking my first official gigs at the age of like 11. Um, But I will say a lot of that now in retrospect, a lot of the way I was living as a kid, a lot of the activities and the, you know, super packed jam schedules of rehearsals and all the things that I was doing and having to be, um, you know, basically a very overactive schedule led Mm. to a very sort of overactive mindset. And it's just, you know, it's no coincidence that in turn, I developed an overactive immune system. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the life I lived as a kid was not stress-free. And I Mm -hmm. do feel like, you know, yes, I was genetically predisposed to having lupus, but there were some you know, life factors that triggered, possibly, possibly triggered Mm -hmm. um, lupus actually coming to fruition for me at that age. Yeah, I can trace back some of that too to my, you know, I had a tough time in sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And that's kind of when my symptoms started coming out. And, you know, I think that's, that's a really interesting um, perspective. And I think, I think a lot of lupus patients feel that same way that they can sort of trace back that stressor I've heard a lot of stories where people are in, you know, whether they're athletes, it's like the physical exertion, the stress, the, the exhaustion, then suddenly they started developing more symptoms. Um, but for me, I, I was, I was in a singing group with Motown records from the age of 12 to 15. And, and we were in the midst of touring the country, you know, endless rehearsal shows, back to back stuff, and then having to also turn in homework to school at the end Mm -hmm. of a long, performance night, but I, I do remember what sort of set it off was um, um, I was bitten by a ton of mosquitoes when we were in, really? I think it was Atlanta. Huh. And from there started developing some rashes, but I were a little bit curious. And then that just sort of ballooned from there and just sort of spun out. And, and so out. how long, I mean, that's a very unique way to sort of spark the fire, I guess. So how long until your lupus diagnosis was, was figured it out? Took- 
ever to diagnose because they all, you know, initially you know, my lupus symptoms were fairly mild. It was the malar rash, fatigue. But if, again, we thought maybe the fatigue could be attributed to what my schedule was like as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the, the, the joint pain started coming into play. And so we went, I think it was maybe about a good you know, 10 months to a year before I was officially sent to a rheumatologist to then diagnose me. And also at the time, lupus awareness and just knowledge about it in general was nowhere near what it is today. So I went to dermatologists, allergists, uh, uh, the gamut of doctors before I actually found out what was going on with me. Um, And once you found out, once you were diagnosed, did that motivate you more or did it change did it alter sort of what you thought your path should or would be at the time i did i don't think i had the maturity and wherewithal to understand the scope of what that meant Mm -hmm. what i understood was okay this is new i don't like that i have you know i think i was more concerned about vanity you know as far as the, having a butterfly rash right. suddenly on my face having rashes along all along my arms and hands and legs and feet my hair was falling out in chunks so i think i was more like you know at that age which is which is excusable i was worried about what that meant for me just as far as how i'm presenting and so my concern at the time was what just give me the medicine to make that go away. And what I didn't realize is that, you know, prednisone then does have its side effects of Mm -hmm. the moon face and all the other things. So needless to say, I I had a very sobering lesson at 15 years old about what really matters. Um, It took me a while to come to terms with that. And I do think, you know, even to this day, now that I am much, much older, it is, I, I still, um, have moments where I need to remind myself that acceptance of it is uh, acceptance of having lupus and understanding what that means is, is so essential to your healing and recovery. Um, Mm -hmm. Because then that in turn makes you think about what your limitations are and how you have to be respectful of those limitations, how Mm -hmm. self care is so important. Um, and, you know, I say all this, I, I, I still, I, I have to practice what I preach and I have to, I go in phases of, as soon as I start to feel better, then I start to pile everything back on into my life and my schedule again. But there have been well, I mean, times- just being a showrunner on a major network right. show is enough stress for three people, you know, right. healthy people. So I, I wonder how you were able to kind of carve out your physical needs Um, while taking on such a big responsibility? Well, a huge part of why I'm able to do anything that I do is because of my partner in life and and work, my husband, um, Mm -hmm. Jed Whedon. Uh, I think without- By the way, I never told you this, but my brother's name is Jed. And there's oh, really? very few Jeds in the world. So I think they're kindred spirits, but <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but- No, I, no, I not at all. Um, but he, he is definitely, because we can divide and conquer, um, when I do have to step away, he, he does a lot of the heavy lifting, um, over the course of shield. I think it was, uh, in the middle of season two, where I was blessed with my little baby. And, um, but that of course led to several complications. And while I was out for that, you know, he had to not only juggle, um, everything he was navigating at work, but also coming to the hospital every day. And then once Benny Sue was born, she was in the NICU. She was born so early at 29 weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was going between floors at Cedars, like visiting me and visiting her and going back and forth from work. So, so tell the audience a little bit about, you told me before, but about what getting pregnant was like as I know that was a huge part of your lupus story and, right. then, and then how that's really altered the course of your, of your illness uh, while at the same time, obviously bringing you uh, your greatest joy. Before I tell you about my journey, my very um, fragile journey into motherhood, I, I guess maybe I should take you through all the flares that I've had and why pregnancy was never in the cards for me and 
all of that. So with my early, yeah, I, I think I probably should have actually, because it, what I found really interesting about it, and I, you're going to touch on that right now is mm -hmm. how many different sort of roads you've gone down in the lupus where, you know, usually you get a lupus patient who, if they have kidney issues, that's their primary focus, but your mm -hmm. disease has really run the gamut from, and, and I know you're about to describe that, but I found that to be medically really interesting. Yes, yes, medically interesting and extremely taxing. Right. Um, no, it really has run the gamut on me, and I'm not sure if it's because I've I have lived with it for so long. Um, but it, as I said, it started off fairly mild, and and even those symptoms are 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 pretty um, traumatic for people just as far as the rash and the fatigue and the joint pain, that's, 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 that's a hard, that's a hard life to deal with on a daily basis. But I was able to, with the use of prednisone and Plaquenil and whatever other sort of anti-inflammatory drug that was thrown my way. But um, I would say as I entered my late twenties, early thirties, that's when it started attacking some major organs, the first one being uh, my lungs. I, I, had, I was hospitalized for pulmonary vasculitis. And each one of these flares, even though like I'm in the hospital maybe for a week or two per flare, the residual effects and, and me actually recovering from that flare take up to you know, well over a year to officially be done with the ramifications of that flare. So, Pulmonary, pulmonary vasculitis led to me doing um, cytoxin treatments for that uh, chemotherapy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was hard to tell my symptoms, what were, what was lupus, what was side effects from the cytoxin. Um, but then I started running these very high fevers which also is characteristic of lupus, which also is characteristic of a side effect of chemotherapy. So it was very hard to tell, but they were so consistent. And then what that led to was a flare of the um, central nervous system, which basically mimicked the symptoms of um, meningitis. Hospitalized for that. And I think that one was a, a really big one as far as the loss of function. Um, I couldn't see, I couldn't, um, it, it, it sort of inflamed a nerve along the spine that controls your bladder. So I couldn't do that on my own. I lost um, motor skills. And of course the height of that flare last, lasted for maybe two weeks, but then the recovery from that was a good two years, just as far as putting all the pieces back together and mm -hmm. the, um, the treatment for that, you know, a lot of anti-anxiety medications and things like that. And, and I say in between each flare, whenever I got better, whenever I felt like I'm in, I, my symptoms have lessened enough that I can enter back into the world. I did. And that's when, you know, I, I didn't really talk about um, each lupus flare until my kidney flare in 2012. Um, but of course, I, I sort of concealed the severity of my lupus with each job that I had um, because I felt like I didn't want lupus to define who I was. I didn't want anyone to have a perception that I may not be a viable candidate for whatever job. Um, but I've learned my lesson in that regard. It's, it's not that lupus defines me, but it is absolutely a part of who I am. And I'm grateful for that in that I definitely have a heightened awareness of what matters. I, I am aware of my mortality. And so things are much more precious to me, I think, or I'm aware of how precious this life yeah. is. Um, I think we all are experiencing that collectively right now, given the, the state of things and what we're living through right now. But um, I'm going down this long list of, of the things that I've been through flare wise, only to say that it's so obvious as to why every doctor was like, you cannot um, even entertain the idea of becoming pregnant because that I mean, look at everything you've endured so far. The pregnancy will just send your body into another tailspin. Um, and 
And why don't we, you know what I'm going to do? Let's take a quick break. Sure. Uh, we're going to get some lupus interstitials and uh, we'll be right back after this message. Lupus LA provides the lupus community with a variety of educational opportunities through patient conferences, webinars, Facebook live chats, and one-on-one -on -one support to the lupus community. Visit our website at lupusla.org. All right, we're back on the Your Story, Our Fight podcast with Marissa Tancheron. And now we were just about sort of, we've been through the pulmonary flare and the CNS flare and now it's Benny Sue's journey and, and, and yes. what that did. And yes, um, there was one more flare before Benny Sue came into the world. Um, in 2012, my kidneys, uh, I was diagnosed with diffuse proliferative nephritis, um, lupus nephritis. It was pretty severe and it set on pretty fast. And I noticed it with just, I suddenly had severe edema. I think my legs were five times their normal size. My feet were, they look like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man feet. <laughs> um, and again, I did rounds of chemo. Um, and again, doctors reminded me, because Jed and I were married for three years at the time. And of course, you know, with the love we have for one another, obviously we wanted to have a child. Um, so whenever I would ask, they would say, you can't do that to yourself or to your body. You can't take that risk. Needless to say, I got through the kidney flare and um, with the help of some supplemental alternative medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, and for the first time in forever or ever, I would say, I was in remission. Mm -hmm. And I was in long enough remission and remission for me isn't exactly free and clear from lupus. I still have mild right. lupus activity in my blood work. I'm still on prednisone. I'm still on Plaquenil, um, all those things. But I, my symptoms had lessened enough that, that all my wonderful doctors had signed off on me trying. And of course, instantly pregnant. <laughs> Benny was so meant to be here. Yeah. <laughs> it, like all the obstacles that were stacked against her, she was like, nope, meant to be here. Um, I had 20 weeks of such a blissful pregnancy and I was doing every, I thought I was doing everything right. You know, my diet, the way I was um, getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, exercising, doing all the things, but lupus does not work that way. It rears its ugly head no matter what you do because that's just the nature of the illness. And so in my 20th week, I started to see the swelling again and I knew, oh boy, this isn't just pregnancy swelling, this is something else. Um, the telltale sign for me is the puffiness in my eyes. And then of course I went to my nef nephrologist, did labs, did a um, 24 hour urine mm -hmm. test and uh, yeah, my, my protein had skyrocketed, um, my proteinuria, my blood pressure was so high. And again, it's a combo of things during pregnancy. Is it preeclampsia? Is it the nephritis? What is it? But regardless, um, it started from the ER. I think it was like, uh, yeah, the going into the end of, sorry, New Year's of 2014, I was in the ER and then just basically in and out of the hospital until she was born in March. Um, and she was born at 29 weeks, just a little warrior. Um, she came into the world kicking and screaming, her lungs were fine. And, and the, whole, the whole goal was to at least hold her up until tw the 28th or 29th week so that her right. lungs would be in good enough shape for her to then survive in the NICU. Um, but between my 20th week and the 29th week, it was uh, a very dire situation. There was a lot of, it was just a matter of preserving my kidneys and me, holding, holding the kidneys in a dire state with tons and tons and tons of steroids. They weren't able to administer the usual things that they could um, mm -hmm. because I was carrying my child. Um, so 
the best course of action was to hold her for as long as I could. And once I got to the 29th week, I was like, please, 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 let me go further. Let me, let me at least get a couple right. more weeks in so that she can be even healthier. And, um, but I, we couldn't risk it. We couldn't risk the damage to my kidneys. And, uh, so but that's mentally say, traumatic. I mean, the whole, oh, I mean, I mean, the whole, know, those nine weeks must've been torture. Yes. And, and there were many days where I felt like I'm not going to make it. Um, and I remember, and this is a story that, that, uh, perhaps only the, the family really knows, but I'll tell you anyway, but, um, <laughs> I had a moment where things were so dire and I was, I was so, um, done with being sick. I think it was more about the lupus part. It had nothing to do with the pregnancy. It was just that I was so angry that yet again, I'd been given, you know, I'd been given this gift, this gift that I thought I never would be able to have. I, th I thought, okay, I I'm going, we're going to have a baby. This is happening. And then I felt like lupus was taking that away from me again, taking something precious away from me again. And I think I was just at the point of, 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 just being so beyond angry that I didn't know how to process it and come out of it. And I was, I, I was in such pain. I was so, so swollen to the point where like, I couldn't even walk on my feet without having to hold my legs up high and let the edema flow towards my knees before I can even take a few steps to make my way to the kitchen for a glass of water, whatever it is. It was just, it had become such a, daily traumatic thing. And I, and there were conversations with uh, various doctors as to whether or not we were doing the right thing. And so that was weighing heavily on my mind. And I thought, um, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it. And it was at, at that moment, she kicked me so hard for the first time. <laughs> And I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I wasn't even saying any of that. You're here. You're here. We're doing this. We're doing, we're going to make it. It's going to be just fine. She, yeah. she, they she's listen. Me here. Meant yeah. She's like, listen, lady, you've got how this old is far. she now? She is turning six next month. And oh, she wow. is just an amazing, strong, remarkable, just, you know, spirit. I just, yeah. Um, we're so grateful. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I, when I hear that story, I, the word hero really is what keeps going through my mind. And I think with your career, you've sort of, you know, for the last seven, seven seasons been immersed in the world of superheroes and heroes. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how much of your writing, um, sort of relies on your experience in terms of those heroes arcs and those stories. I, I, I do think that so much of what Jed and I have experienced together as a couple living through these um, high stakes life in the balance experiences together. Um, and then in turn, like becoming parents together and it, it hasn't been without its challenges just as far as our, my health goes, my daughter's health goes. She's, she's already survived so much in her, you know, six year existence. Um, but I do think a lot of that informed much of our characters arcs, a lot of the storylines, what we were able to address just as far as um, the awareness of one's mortality and just getting back up and, and st standing in the fight yet again. Um, we were able to address that in metaphor and also just able to address that within the relationships between characters over the years. And I do think when it comes to the show, it does exist in the wish fulfillment grand scope of the Marvel universe. But I think at the heart of it is, is that bond between the family of characters that we, that we developed and and I would hope that our personal experience was definitely um, felt in the course of the show. Yeah. And on the flip side, do you take things from your characters that 
I mean, does it sort of work both ways? I mean, cause you're writing such a um, sort of epic tale mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I always find those tales to be so inspirational. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when you, when you spend that much time working on a show, not only on the characters and the story, but with the actors portraying those characters and the crew that are, that are there, they're just like on the ground with you in the trenches, scrambling to make things happen on a daily basis. And it was definitely a, you know, at times it was a pressure cooker situation because we're churning out these gigantic episodes within such a short, you know, span time frame. Um, there is this collective feeling of, 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 of being in it together and the inspiration that comes from that. So I do think, you know, when you're working that deeply in something, things do, the line between reality and the show gets a little fuzzy, starts to blend. And so I, I do think a lot of our personal lives, as well as our entire writing staff, they brought their personal things to the table as well. That informed the story. And then our characters also, uh, I think we would, we would eat, sleep, dream the characters all the time. Yeah. Right. Field right. was definitely our first baby. And then Benny Sue came along and then she became a part of that family as well. I think she had, um, in order for any of this to work as a working, as working parents who were that invested in the show, also, you know, considerations for my health. We had a, we had a room that was Benny's room at work um, so that she could be there with us as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely a family affair. And so I don't think I would have survived any of it if it wasn't for the support of the community there, having my family there, um, my husband, my daughter, my brother who directed so many of the episodes. My father was the head of transportation the transportation coordinator of the show. So I will say like, I had such a built-in support system there, the cast, the crew, they all became like family to us. Everyone was aware when I was severely sick while pregnant, um, a lot of people rallied around me. Um, the whole production contributed so much to raising lupus awareness. Like, I, I don't know how many times I had them do things for lupus. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, it was definitely, uh, I was able to get through all of it and, and accomplish all of it at the same time because of the support I had. All right, we're going to take one more break and then we're going to come back and talk about the daily routine, sort of what, what gets you through these, uh, these crazy scheduled days and, and things like that. So we'll be right back. Please visit our online store at lupusla.org. By purchasing Lupus LA products, you are directly supporting lupus patients and their families. Visit our website at lupusla.org. Okay, we're back and we're talking about what are the what are your I, I'll call them hacks, although that's probably not a good word for it. But what what are the things that you've picked up along the way that can really help uh, manage your stress and and manage your your lupus? Mm -hmm. uh, well. For a long time, when I, when I was first diagnosed, I wasn't really listening to my doctors. And I think that was also part of being a teenager as well. I was like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll go to the beach. I'll be in the sun for hours at a time. Anyways, as I've grown and through all the flares that I've been through, definitely listen to what your doctors are telling you to do. That, that's number one. Um, keep a journal especially if you're in a flare. I feel like that really helped. When you're in a flare, you also go into sort of a mental fog. And I think if you have it written down, what your symptoms are on a daily basis, how they've improved, how they've gotten worse, then you can go with a clear picture to your doctor and, and you can figure it all out together. Um, I definitely think being your own advocate um, really is helpful in your path to recovery from an, a severe flare or path to recovery in general. Um, Self-care, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you blend any, uh, do, like, I know the latest thing 
that we've been talking about for a few years now is this um, integrated medicine aspect. And I always, I, I always want to ask everybody sort of where, where that fits in, you know, cause I'm a very do what the doctor says kind of patient, but then I add in other things. And I've noticed even the doctors are more open to it. Now, for yeah. sure. Way much more sort of open-minded about what alternative therapies can be useful um, in just trying to keep the symptoms at bay. And I, I've, I've done everything under the sun because I was diagnosed so early. So I've, I've done the craziest things that it's like voodoo stuff, but <laughs> I finally <laughs> found, uh, I think through Ayurvedic medicine and with the help of this amazing Ayurvedic therapist named Martha Soffer. Tell Surrey, people what that is. Cause I want to make sure everybody knows. I think at the, the core of it and sort of the main takeaway for those of us living with, um, bodies that are out of control. Uh, the mind, body, soul connection is so important. What's going on in your mind will definitely affect what's happening in your body. And so the more you can quiet the mind, the more you can take moments, even if it's just five minutes a day to just be still. Um, I feel like because I've lived because as a child I was diagnosed, I have this um, innate hypervigilance, which always keeps me on extra alert because I, I always think that my body is just gonna go crazy out of nowhere. Um, so I have to work extra hard at quieting that and calming that down. And so my exposure to Ayurvedic medicine has, has, has led to um, adopting a meditation practice. I'm not as diligent about it now, now that I have a six-year-old child um, and we're you know, doing online school and everything. My, um, my capacity or my like inclination for self-care is it's really diminished, but I- Everybody need- thinks it's easy to find 10 minutes, but I mean, I, I, cause I have a meditation plan as well. And it's, you know, yeah. a four and a half year old and a one year old and a dog yeah. and forget it, you know, yeah. it's find the time, but it is so important. And I ha- you know, in order for us to be our best selves for our kids, we have to be more balanced. We have to get rest. And, you know, that's all easier said than done, but that is, I, I that is so important. Diet has been a big thing for me. And that is a huge part of the Ayurvedic medicine, um, lifestyle is uh, you eat according to what makes your body less inflamed. And for me specifically, I now, because of, because I've had two very severe lupus nephritis flares, I now live with chronic kidney disease. You know, I have so much scarring in my kidneys that um, they're at 60% function. So Mm -hmm. I have to be very mindful of my sodium intake. I, I, I have, um, I only sparingly eat animal protein on like a special occasion. Um, So it's mostly a vegetarian based diet. Um, Anything like that will help you survive Mm -hmm. (laughs) this thing that we are dealing with. (laughs) So what is next for you? What's the, what's coming up? What is the next mountain to climb? Um, the next mountain to climb is I, I think we we have some things in the works, some new shows and new um, that we want to do under our company banner. I think coming off of a show of seven years, we definitely were looking to 2020 as our kind of year to catch up with one another, to be with our daughter, to maybe travel. Cause well, she you has- got that, right? <laughs> you, got, you got the spending time to uh, yeah. part, right? <laughs> so then we were like, oh, well, maybe this isn't exactly how we wanted to spend <clears throat> this year off. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think everybody sort of vacillates on a daily basis between intense, uh, despair and also gratitude. And I think at the end of every day, what we've uh, realized is that yes, this year has been very different for everyone, but we have taken this time to be with one another. We're all healthy. This is the healthiest that I've been. Hmm. I'm not catching any colds that then lead to some flare of some kind. Sure. My daughter, um, who does have fragile lungs 
uh, this is the healthiest she has ever been. So we'll take that and, um, and be grateful for it. Excellent. Well, I have really enjoyed this conversation and I know our listeners will. And, um, you know, I'm looking like I was just like, I don't know, talking a million miles a minute. But <laughs> no, listen, I I'm telling you, I think that what you have said and what how you've said it is so relatable. And I think, um, you know, the success you've had is intimidating to a lot of people who live with chronic illness. And I think it's so inspirational to see that you can do it if you take, take that control and carve out kind of what you need to balance, you know, your work and your life. And, you know, and, and I think that it's, I think a lot of lupus patients are like that. And I think it's something that's what we really want to share with these stories. I mean, that's, what's really, I think so inspirational to me, um, and, and I know it's hard to sort of think of yourself that way, but I, I, I think of you that way for sure. Yeah. You know, you, you nailed it on the head. Balance is key and, and acknowledging when you are feeling run down and to respect that and take a moment and um, really listen to your body. It's, it's hard when you're caught up in the, in the grind of things and, and you think, oh, let me just get through this next hour. And then for, for people like us, you pay such a higher price for just pushing yourself that extra hour. So mm-hmm. the spoon theory is, is, is something that I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. I remember reading that a few years ago and I was like, oh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. If you push, then you're going to have to maybe be in bed for the next two days. Yeah. It's all, it's all about balance. It's yeah. all about balance. Well, thanks, Marissa, and uh, thank you all for listening, and we'll be back uh, with our next episode. On behalf of the entire team at Lupus LA, we thank you for joining the Your Story, Our Fight podcast. Please tune in, spread the word, and come back for more inspiring lupus stories. I'm your host, Adam Selkowitz, wishing you good health, and to always remember, your story is our fight.